Excellent. Right, good evening, everyone. My name is Pete Botts. Uh, I'm a solicitor with Black Solicitors, uh, which is a firm of solicitors in Leeds. Uh, but I work in the music, media, and entertainment department of the firm. Uh, and tonight, just want to come and, and really give you some ideas, sort of starting points for things to look about, uh, look into, um, with regards to music law matters. I've got some slides with me. We don't have to stick to these too rigidly. So if, if you guys have got questions or you want to really ask about something in particular, we can really kind of go off piste if you like. But what I was going to talk about really today is just the practical elements of music law. I'm not going to really get bogged down in a whole lot of statute and all sorts of contractual complexities. It's not, it's not really the time to do that. It's really trying to think about the practical elements and the, you know, the most important things to get uh, to understand um, st uh, at these the early stages. So we'll look at contract law, the, what, the basics of how a contract's formed, look at some intellectual property law focusing on copyright. A lot of people have questions about copyright and what that means and how it all works. And I also want to do a bit of a spotlight on band partnership agreements because a lot of bands get together and they think, well, you know, we're just a band, aren't we? But legally, you're actually a partnership, and various sort of legal um, obligations arise um, under the common law in our country as a result of that. And when I say band agreements, that doesn't just mean you're kind of guitar rock band. That could be sort of a hip hop collective. It could be people running a label together. It could be all sorts of things. So it's just something to bear in mind. I think a lot of people will find that when you get contracts, there's a sort of dream as a band. I want to be signed, and um, it's a fixation on signing a contract. But what I really want to flag up straight away is, well, what is it you're actually signing? Because people fixate on being signed, but if the person you're signing, if you're giving everything to that entity, record company, whatever, and they're doing nothing for you in return, then there's no point in being signed. So if you understand the principles of how contracts are formed, then it gives you the tools to really look at a document you're given and sometimes you look at them and think this is a joke you know this is just they want everything from me I'm going to get nothing out of it and potentially be tied into it for years uh, you come across a lot of bands where they've signed up something they didn't understand it they're not getting paid and they think oh well, we can just get out of the situation and actually they can't so um, that's why it's important to understand this so a bit of legals here but try and keep it quite light the basic principles of how you, in England and Wales, how contracts are formed. So you have, you have an offer, acceptance of that offer, consideration, the legal term. It basically means something of value um, passing from one party to the other. So that can be money, it can be services, it can be all sorts of different things. And finally, an intention to create legal relations. The point in that is that if you say to someone, I'll see you down the pub tonight, and he says, yeah, okay, I'll buy you a drink. You can't sue someone if they don't turn up because that's not really, it's not intention to create a contract in that sort of way. If you're trying to contract with someone who's under 18, uh, then you could have issues with whether they're competent to enter into a contract and sometimes those contracts can be voidable. Um, so you need to be careful. So if you're you know, running a label or you're putting on shows and the artist is under 18, you could potentially put a lot of money into that artist and they could just turn around and walk away from a contract. So you need to be careful about that. Part of the under 18s. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Because as part of our, we run a hip hop education organisation. Okay, great, yeah. And over the last six months, we put two releases out. Mm -hmm. One of them was a young people's release, under yeah. 26. Yeah. Some of the artists came in at under 18. Mm -hmm. Is there a contract you can write? You know, because most of the things we do with under 18 is they need count signing by a parent or guardian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it possible to do things like this on a. Yeah, it's, it, it can be quite a complicated area because traditionally people have tried to get a parent or guardian to sort of um, guarantee the contract, if you like. The basic principle is if it's very difficult to have um, for music industry contracts to have someone guarantee. So if, if, you're, if the under-18 artist says, I'm not doing this anymore, you can't have the parent or guardian step in and perform, because obviously that would be ridiculous. So um, there are elements, that you can, the way that you can word it. So if there are losses, for example, if you're putting money into release, you can perhaps have a contract with the parents for the provision of um, services or goods, which is a direct, you know, it's a contract with the parents rather than, than with the artist. Um, there are other provisions as well um, under sort of law. If you've got educational aspects to contracts, that is some, if they have, there's sort of exceptions to this rule. So if it's for contracts for necessities or for educational aspects to it, sometimes they can be enforceable. Cool. All right. Um, a really important point, sorry, at the bottom here, a contract can be oral or it can be in writing. 
Um, that's absolutely fundamental, and a lot. It still stands, which is spoken That's right. Yeah, we'll, we'll come on to talk about that a bit more. Um, but that, that's the principle. So you can agree to something, and if it's oral, you know, it's an oral agreement. So long as it has those, these other uh, elements above, then potentially, you know, it will be just as binding as something that's in writing. But there are various reasons why it's preferable to have it written down. Obviously, so <laughs> we'll come on to that after today. If you go. Just Google, just for like a standard record contract, you'll probably come up with something. Um, you can get quite easily bogged down in sort of what we call legalese, you know, all these kind of terms. Sometimes they're quite antiquated and get phrases like, you know, whereas and, and things are witnessed and you think, oh, I just don't understand what this is about. Um, try and not be sort of blinded by science with it all and try and think, well, what is the deal? That is, that is the crux of this whole issue. What is the deal? Who are the parties to the agreement? And what is actually being agreed? Everything else supports that and will tend to um, cover off you know, the what-ifs and all that sort of stuff. But at heart, that is what should be in a record contract. You've probably heard this term 360 deals, which uh, sort of companies trying to take a more sort of all-encompassing view of an artist. So they tend to now start to look for artists to provide their recorded services, live services. Um, they might want something like your, um, your merchandising rights, these sorts of things. They're the sorts of things of value you have as an artist that other companies will want. Um, skip down past producer. What about a manager? What do you think a manager is going to do? value. But these are the sort of questions, you see what I mean? This is what you need to ask yourself. So someone comes up to you and says, I want to manage you. And sometimes you think, you know, if you're inexperienced, you think, oh, this is quite flattering. Yeah, OK. And so you sign to the manager and you think, well, what is he actually doing? So when you look at a contract he offers, you'd expect to see manager's obligations. Manager will do X, Y, and Z set out. So actually, a lot of the time, managers won't do gigs. So maybe they might do that, but they often have um, a booking agent or will have a contact with a booking agent who will take care of that. But you'd expect a manager to have some sort of overall strategy for um, how you know, the artist's career, have contacts, certainly, um, have the experience to negotiate with different sorts of people, have that overall guidance of being able to see someone who's like a raw talent or have that talent. How do you, you know, take it to the audience, take it to labels, be able to negotiate those sorts of skills. But that's the thing of value. And finally, record label c consideration. Any ideas on that one? You get provisions and agreements which say this agreement, this paper agreement, is everything we've agreed and everything surrounding it um, is discounted. So that's, you know, that's the sort of thing you need to be wary of. But. Okay. Uh, this final point here is just really important. It's a restraint of trade. It's a legal concept, which basically means that if contracts are so one-sided, i.e., you know, the, the consideration from the artist is you're giving them everything, but what's coming back from the label is, or the manager or anything is, is not, it's not balanced. You have what you can get into a situation which is restraint of trade. I'm just going to talk briefly about a couple of like famous artists you probably all heard of that have been through these kind of issues.